Praise God. Hallelujah. Y'all good? Y'all ready? Me too. I'm ready. Um, I was thinking about some, just some times that, that God has moved as we were praying for Juan and, and praying for healing. I started thinking about some times when, uh, when we've had some pretty cool testimonies. And some of the fun ones are the fact when, when you don't know the details. That's why, you know, when I ask somebody like to pray for them, I don't, I don't want them to talk too much and try to build all the faith up in how big the problem is. But maybe just specify um, I remember praying for this young man who had a, a, a hurt wrist. It was just simple. Uh, people said, if there's so, someone here needs healing, stand up. And, and different people in the room stood up. Well, this young man stood up beside me, so there's my target, you right? So I just asked him what he needed prayer for, and he's like, well, I need prayer for my wrist. I'm like, okay, pray for your wrist. So I put my hand on his wrist, and I started praying and just commanding healing into it. And I didn't say a lot to him, and he didn't say a lot to me. I just was speaking life into this wrist, and I felt something something move in the wrist while I was praying. Some of y'all probably had similar things happen, but what was weird was it was like there was a bump right here and then the bump left. You know, it was just little little something. You know, thinking, huh. And he goes, huh. he kind of did that little surprise, and he starts moving his wrist, and he's like, oh, praise God. And I'm like, wow, that's cool. You got your wrist healed up. He goes, no, I had fractured my wrist. I had screws and pins in my wrist, and I couldn't move it like this, and there's no, I can't, that screw's not there. So what moved, what left was the metal. <laughs> now, if he'd have told me what was going on, I'd I'd have been like, uh, you know, I might have been a little thinking a little like, let's get some help, <laughs> more people praying or whatever, somebody with bigger faith. But I mean, God just healed him just because we believed and asked. Um, I remember uh, Bill Johnson giving a testimony one time talking about someone in the church getting healed, and it was the same kind of thing. Person stood up and he said he needed his ankle healed. And uh, so the people around him started praying, and the guy started jumping around. He was, like, he was all excited that his ankle was healed. But then he told them what had happened was he had had surgeries on it, and he had, a, uh, he had rods, pins, and he had, they had fused the ankle so it, it, it was to the side, and he couldn't bend it. It was fused. And he's jumping around and moving his ankle. And all the people that prayed for him were like, we didn't know that. <laughs> we just heard him say, I need healing in my ankle. And sometimes we... We think God's limited by our understanding. We limit God. He's not limited. He's the creator of the universe, and he can do anything. We've had prayer times. I remember when Kathy prayed for this one person that had a, like, was it a, like a tumor under the neck? I mean, you could just see this tumor and just, whoop. I mean, it just, just left. And it's fun when you get to see it. You don't always get to see it. I prayed for somebody one time had a, a, a bump on the top of their foot, and they, they were walking with, with a lot of pain. And so I'm like, what's going on? Oh, is, my foot's hurting. You could see the, this big red thing and this bump. And I was like, what is, I don't know what I did. And I said, well, let me pray. And they got nervous, like, don't touch it. <laughs> it was like, it was hurt, don't touch it. So I kind of cut my hand over like this and put it on there, prayed just for a second. We were all together, and I just lifted my hand up, and that thing was gone. And it's just fun to see... God's power is available to whosoever believes. And that didn't even happen in church. That didn't even happen in church. That happened in a restaurant. <laughs> God, God, the Bible says believers shall lay hands on the sick and they'll recover. Right? right? Believers. It didn't say the apostles. It didn't say for a season. It said those who believe. And if we'll believe and trust, we'll see the miraculous things in the kingdom. The problem is... We don't pursue these things many times because we want to protect either our own reputation, whatever we think we have. We don't want to be embarrassed if something doesn't happen. And God doesn't need our help to protect his reputation. He doesn't. You just got to trust and go for it. Well, what if, what if it doesn't happen? What if it does? I mean, Randy Clark used to come to our church uh, on a regular basis. Before we started this church, the church we were attending, he would come on a regular basis. And I remember him saying he would pray for people and that didn't even go to church and say, do you mind if I pray for you? You know, lots of times I've seen God do some pretty amazing things. He would say it like that. I've seen God do things many times. Many times I've seen some miracles. He didn't say, I can guarantee you right now. He just said the truth. Many times I've seen some pretty amazing things. Can I pray for you? And miracles would happen. God is a miracle working God. The problem is we don't put him out there for people to get healed 
from? We, we're, we're just like, Jesus wants to heal, and we're not letting him out. We're not pursuing those encounters. Are you hear me? If we don't put it in the forefront of our mind, if we don't start thinking this way, then we won't take a risk. We won't even think about a risk. But the more we talk about it, the more we give testimony of it, the more we celebrate it, the more it will multiply. And it really starts coming because of your conversations and what's in your mind first. When you see somebody limping, you won't just go, oh, they're limping. You'd be like, hey, can I pray for you? You start to think about stepping out. I remember when we were doing fire starters and we'd do some testimony times, this would happen so many times. People would go somewhere like they felt like I'm supposed to go to this store or whatever. They'd go in and meet somebody behind the counter or something and say, hey, uh, do you have any pain in your body? Do you have any sickness, anything we can pray for? And they go, no. And they go, oh. <laughs> the person would be like, thanks. <laughs> you don't have any pain? Oh. And they're just looking for opportunity to give something away. And when you are looking for that, you're going to see miracles. We would have services or, or classes and say, okay, we're going to teach on this, and then we're going to go out and do. And it's interesting to me that the sovereign Lord of the universe chose those moments when we decided to go to heal people. He chose, you know, we wouldn't, we decide, all right, we're all going to go out and let's pair up or let's get in teams of three or four. And people would go out and we'd have 20 teams. And all of a sudden, because we left the building and went and told people, 30 people got healed. 40 people got healed. It wasn't always major. It wasn't like people jumping out of wheelchairs, but it was still healing. And we would be, learn to celebrate even the small things that God was doing, and it would increase. I remember uh, when we were learning to do this, the person that was teaching us was saying things about like, let, let me give you an example. I want to pray for, you know, your, your knees hurting or your legs hurting. What kind of pain level are you at? And they say, well, I'm on a scale of 1 to 10, where are you? They say, well, it's about a 6 or a 7. It, it hurts. You know, it's pretty bad. Okay, can I pray for you? And they'd pray and say, well, check it. You know, check it. And they would check it, and is it, is it, is it still there? Yeah. What's it, what is it now? Is it still a 6 or 7? Well, no, it's kind of a, kind of a 4. Glory to God. I mean, just celebrate. Why? You just had a miracle. It went from a seven to a four. I mean, pain level's leaving. Let's pray again and pray again. Jesus prayed more than once for a blind man. Jesus prayed more than once for a blind man to get healed. Amen? Yep. Why can't we pray more than once? Why can't we stand and believe and see something? There was a guy teaching us one time. It was so funny. He was... He was uh, he was being trained to pray for people, and the person that was doing this had crowds of people coming. The sick would come. And so he's a spiritual son, and he's learning how to do this. And so his spiritual father told him, uh, I want you to pray for this man. This man was in a wheelchair and couldn't walk. I want you to pray for this man. And so he said, I want you to stay with him, and I want you to pray. And he did. He stayed with him, and he prayed. And the man went on with the service and started, people were getting healed. And after a very long while, that young man came back into the service, and he was sitting there, and he said, is he still in the wheelchair? And he goes, yeah. Why are you here? Get back over there and pray for him. <laughs> He's like, I've been praying. Well, go pray some more. <laughs> and this was the honest testimony of this young man. He said, I went over there, and, and I leaned on the back of his wheelchair. And he said, it's been a long, a long service, long night. He's tired. He said, I'm leaning on the back of his wheelchair, and I'm praying for him. It's been going on for a while. And he said, I fell asleep. <laughs> he said, I'm praying and praying. And finally, I dozed off, leaning on the back of his wheelchair. It had been so many, I don't know if it was an hour or two praying. He said, I woke up startled because he woke me up as he stood up out of the wheelchair. <laughs> he woke me up. So you know how mighty my faith was, he said. <laughs> he woke me up standing up. That's a good way to get woke up. God's just looking for a vessel. He's not looking for the, 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 the powerful warriors to go out and show what they can do. He's just looking for a vessel. And that's it. I want to talk to you today about a message the Lord gave me, um, actually, <laughs> la 
Last Sunday, I thought I was going to preach this, and he changed it on us, threw me a curveball, and he told me this week, he's like, okay, you can release that word. So the title of today's message is Responsible for the Pursuit. Responsible for the Pursuit. I want to read to you from 1 Corinthians chapter 14, probably a familiar verse to many of you. Verse 1 says, pursue love and desire earnestly spiritual gifts, but especially that you may prophesy. The best way to acquire more in the kingdom of God is to give away what you have. The kingdom works that way. Everything that we have, we should look at as it being in seed form. It's in seed form. While, while Eddie was speaking, I'm like, okay, Eddie's going to preach my message. And then when Kai was up here talking, I thought Kai's going to talk about my message. And we were, we were praying before service. I'm like, here it goes. There's more of the service. But it was, it's all about the pursuit that we have is really a responsibility of ours to go after. He, he gives us the instruction, and then he requires us to do it. Pursue love. He didn't say Love's going to fall on you. He actually says, the love of God has been shed abroad in your heart by the Holy Spirit. But how do you pursue something that's already been given to you? You give it away. You give it away. Because if you want more of something, you, you have to learn how to multiply it. Um, there are people that have a gift and an understanding and wisdom in, in financial things. They really do have insights that, that are phenomenal at times, and they know how to use their money wisely and how to make things multiply and make money work for them. They're really good at it. The problem is we don't learn how to use the gifts that God's given us and see these things multiply in our life. We experience momentary encounters of maybe I prophesied once. Maybe I laid hands on the sick and have a testimony. Maybe I had one of these things happen where... I knew God loved on somebody that in the natural, I wouldn't have loved on them. But he used me to speak to them in a loving way. I've had, I've had testimonies of that. I shared them here with you. People that I probably wouldn't have spent time with. But God loved on them through me, and I just yielded for that. But our responsibility is the pursuit. I'm gonna, when, I'm, when I'm doing the ministry that I do, what I'm called to do is, as a pastor and as a teacher, is to try to bring things very practical to us so we understand how to use what, we, what we're learning. I, I, I'm not a preacher. I love preachers. I'm just not one. I wish I could preach. Sometimes I hear a preacher, I think, man, he can say one sentence 12 times, and it's different all 12 times, and I'm excited every time he says it, and I, I don't have that. But what I do want us to understand is how to apply these principles that God's telling us to use. If you will meditate the Word of God, some reason I lose people right here. We think we know what that means, and so we, yeah, yeah, meditate the Word. Okay, gotcha. No, but are we doing it? Do we take a verse and read it, and then close our eyes again and read it, and then read it till we see it, and then murmur over that word, just saying it, talking it, and then seeing it one word at a time in the whole verse. Is there something he wants to reveal? Is there something that he stops on in that verse? Maybe I can look up the definition of that word in the Greek since it was written in Greek. Maybe there's something I'm missing. Just diving a little deeper, waiting on the Lord and seeing what comes out of it. You know, I don't know about you, but I've, I've read through the Bible quite a bit. I know many of you in this room have read through the Bible quite a bit. Guess what? It doesn't change. It's the same book. <laughs> but Revelation's still coming on a regular basis. I find things all the time. I'm like, how did I not see that? How did I not see that? It's right there. He's unfolding. God never changes, but he's continually unfolding. Yeah. Like a, like, you know, this is old. We used to have maps to go places. I mean, paper maps. You had to unfold them and, and get them all big in the other seat. Like, you look at the map, tell me where to turn. And you, you remember the maps? The maps were there, but, you, but they, were, they were unfolded. And sometimes you get more and more as you keep unfolding that map. 
And sometimes the Word of God just keeps unfolding for us, for us to find revelation. So I want this... I want this thing to get into you for a second. Think about this. Jesus is about to start ministry. The Bible says he was led by the Spirit of God into the wilderness, right? Why? To be tempted of who? The devil. So the Holy Spirit led him into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. That's what the Bible says. He's going to go through his temptation first. He's been fasting now for a long time, and he's starting to get hungry. Experts say that when you, are, when you haven't eaten for a long time, the, hun- you, when the hunger goes away. If you haven't eaten for a while, hunger just it, it eventually goes away. But when the hunger comes back, it's a sign that, of starvation trying to set in. Your body will start consuming the organs. It, it'll feed on itself. It's got to try to survive. So in the moment where the hunger comes back, the enemy comes and tempts him. Um, One of the things the Lord spoke to me years ago, and it, it caught me off guard when he said it, was the Bible doesn't say that Jesus went into the wilderness and the devil appeared to him. Jesus was tempted like you are tempted. Jesus is tempted like I'm tempted. The devil tempted him, but it came here. It came as a thought. It came as words into his mind. It came as a temptation in that way. He wasn't looking at an enemy going, get away from me. Yeah, I see you, devil. I mean, he he wasn't in a face-to-face battle. He was in a battle like you go through, where you're like, is this me? Is this God? Is this the devil? You know, you're hearing but who am I hearing? He was tempted like us. And in that moment of being that hungry, the temptation comes, turn that stone to bread. What did, does anybody in here remember what Jesus said when that temptation came, turn this stone to bread? Anybody know what, what he said? It is written what? Man will not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Notice Jesus didn't didn't say, notice Jesus didn't just think a different thought. He said something. He spoke out of his mouth. It is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Anybody remember the second temptation that came? He heard something else. If you are the son of God, right? Didn't he tell him that throw yourself off this temple? Throw yourself off. And God will give his angels charge over you to protect you. You won't even dash your foot against a stone. Jesus answered him with what? You shall not tempt the Lord your God. You don't tempt or test him or put him to. Then he says, if you are the son of God. If you are the Son of God, bow down and worship me, and I'll give you all these kingdoms. And he told him, be gone, get behind me, go from me. It is written, you shall worship the Lord your God, and him alone shall you serve. Right? Did you notice the power that came into Jesus, the power he released that forced the enemy to leave. He fought him with the word. He spoke the word like a sword, and the enemy left. But did you notice that the words he used were not words of empowerment? Let me explain it to you real simple. I want you to get this. You can fight the devil with a commandment. Yes, amen. With a commandment. What you are commanded to do You can fight him with that word. See, we think, I'm getting tempted to eat this. I'm tempted to turn this stone to bread. I'm tempted to eat now. I'm hungry. I need a verse that talks about when you're hungry, 
You need to be, this will give you strength if you focus on this. This will empower you if you focus on that. He didn't do that. He just said, man shall live, not live by bread alone. The power was in the commandment. And then when he said, just jump off the tab, tab, temple, jump off, off the pinnacle of the temple, he's not going to let anything harm you. Go ahead, just jump. It is written, thou shalt not tempt the... He gave a commandment. Thou shalt not tempt the Lord your God. Don't test him. He didn't say, man, when I'm tempted to prove this, is there a verse that tells me, it's okay, I've got you. You don't have to worry. He didn't look for an empowerment verse. He looked for a commandment. Do you hear me? You don't have to always find this empowerment from some other place. The power is in the word itself. It's not about you getting stronger. It's about you releasing what is already strong. The power is in the word, and the word is in you. And when you release that word with your mouth, there's power in it. It's not about you trying to work up more strength, more courage, more power, more anointing. I don't feel anointed. I don't feel worthy. It doesn't matter. Release the word. The word is powerful, and the word's worthy, and the word's anointed. The devil will tell you, you're not worthy to release a word because you have sin. You're not worthy to say this type of thing because you have not lived sanctified. If you believe it and you stay there, you're never going to be sanctified. You're never going to step out into anything as a son or daughter of God. You're going to just sit. I failed so I'll stay in my failure. How about when you fail, when you fall, don't run from God, run to God. Run, he wants you to run to him. Come boldly to the throne of grace to obtain mercy. He didn't say, you better stay out there for a while. I'm ticked. <laughs> He's not like us. I know what you need. You need mercy. You need grace. You need empowerment. Come on, come on. Run, but come boldly to the throne of grace. Come, 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 come. The enemy keep, tries to keep you at a distance from that grace and from that empowerment. He tries to keep you at a distance from that, but we're to pursue it. Pursue love. What is love? Love's a person. God is love. To pursue love, you have to pursue the person. And in pursuing the person, love starts to come out of you. But the enemy will tell you, you got to stay back. You... you I know what you just did, and so does he. So you better stay back. And why does it say to come boldly to the throne of grace? Because, see, once you've known God and you fail, that would make me think that's the one time you need to whimper, cower, crawl, admit you're really not worthy, because I knew the truth and I failed. How can you come boldly to the throne of grace? You can't come boldly to the throne of grace unless you already know the truth. So you mean someone that knows the truth needs grace? Someone that knows the truth needs mercy? I thought once we got saved, we were, we're perfect, and we never sin again. You see, I'm not making light of sin, never. But what he paid for it was enormous. And with all that he paid... He doesn't want to see us sitting back as if now we can't come. He paid so much. It's like, no, you come boldly. I, I gave you full access. I don't want you go under the table. I want you at the table. You hear me? The pursuit of the things of God is our responsibility, though. We have to make a stand and make a stance. The verse I just read to you in 1 Corinthians 14, sorry, it said also to desire earnestly spiritual gifts, but especially that you would prophesy. And if you've read these verses before, you know why it says that. It says especially that you would prophesy because it starts going into some of the correlations between speaking in tongues, which is a gift of the Spirit, and prophecy. And it says, I would rather you prophesy because when you prophesy, everybody's edified. But when you speak in an unknown tongue, you're edified. But everybody else is going, huh? Unless someone interprets. 
right? For some reason, all these things that do empower us, those are the stumbling blocks in Christianity and in denominations. There's all these divisions around praying in the Spirit, miracles. The things that do bring power and confirm the power of the Lord are the controversial things. Like we could have a day of prayer. We're going to have a downtown day of prayer. Everybody meet at City Hall. All denominations are welcome. Every Christian is welcome. You know what's going to happen? We're all going to get, and they're going to have certain leaders pray. We would like you to pray from this church, and you to pray from this church, and you to pray from the city council, and you to pray from whatever, right? And you know what they're going to do? They're going to put stipulations on only the people who believe in miracles and pray in tongues. No one else will have any safeguards, but don't prophesy, don't speak in tongues, and don't talk about miracles. Just pray. And my response is, pray for what? Because we need a miracle. <laughs> if you're not believing for a miracle, just because it's not someone jumping out of a wheelchair, you still need a miracle. I've been many times at the altar here, and, and I've felt this. I'm, I'm at the altar, and I'm worshiping, and maybe we're transitioning, and I begin to speak in tongues or pray in tongues, and I have felt this because I've, I've gotten this confrontation my whole life of being a Christian. For 35 years, I've encountered certain moments where someone says, you can't do that. You can't pray in tongues in the church. The Bible says it. In the church, you're not supposed to speak in tongues because nobody understands what you're saying. Well, I wasn't talking to you. I mean, I love you, but I wasn't talking to you. <laughs> I wasn't saying, hey, Michelle, I mean, that'd be stupid. That'd be crazy. But if I'm talking to him and we're having a conversation in prayer, I don't have to speak English. Amen. I'm amazed at how people can get offended at types of worship. Like that lady is so demonstrative and she's just whirling around and she's acting all crazy and this one's doing this and this one's doing that. And the way that they do their, how do you know unless you're looking at them? Because if you're worshiping, you don't know what they're doing. I don't know. People will say, did you see so-and-so or did you hear so-and-so? And, -so? and I'm, most of the time, if I'm in worship, I'm like, no. And that's why when worship starts, I walk forward for a reason because I don't, want anybody, I don't want anybody in front of me. I don't even want the opportunity to notice what anybody else is doing because I'm not here for anybody else. At that point, it's me and him. In a moment, I have something to do that's called my calling, and it's going to have an effort toward speaking to people. But at that point, I need him, period. And so if you are demonstrative, if you kneel, if you lift your hands, if you just sit back and cross your... I don't, you do what God tells you to do. It's your living room. But we also don't put pressure on people. My, my sister, one of my sisters, started going to church. God had put on my heart to pray for them to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and they did. Started going to church and then quickly quit going to church because they were going to a church that was very demonstrative. Everybody danced. Everybody jumped. Everybody hooped and hollered. That's, what, that's great. I like the energy. Let's go for it. But the problem is they're looking at my sister because she ain't doing it. <laughs> it's like, so all of a sudden you feel this pressure. I have to perform. If I'm not dancing, I'm not jumping, if I'm not doing what they're doing, then you're not worshiping God if you're trying to get everybody else to do what you're doing. Right. You're, not, you're not with him. You are focusing on the people. There is something powerful about that anointing when everybody corporately goes in together. I love it, man. The energy happens and everybody, or everybody hits their knees together or whatever. I love that. I believe there's power in that. Brianna, I'm so glad you're here because RJ was so tired. <laughs> Inside jokes, if you were. Those of you watching online, sorry. So, anyway, <laughs> your strength has come too, Josh. I see Sarah in the back. So, <laughs> so uh, 
there's not supposed to be a pressure on anybody else to perform. Because if we're really serving Jesus and going after him, right, it doesn't matter what anybody else is doing. A message, can, a message can come, same message. One person wrecked, transformed Rama. This revelation knowledge comes in. Another person sitting there just bored to tears and thinking, when do we eat? I'm ready to go home or whatever and not get anything. And same message. But sometimes the heart's hungry. Jesus said this. Jesus said in his word that the hungry have left full, and those who came full have left empty. See, just because you're filled doesn't mean, or full, doesn't mean it's good. It's good if you're filled because you came for God. But if my wife is going, honey, I marinated some of those steaks that you really like, and I just got them off the grill, and they're perfect. So come eat. And I say, babe, I just had 17 Twinkies. I don't want, <laughs> I don't want a steak right now. That's just foolish, but I ruined my appetite for what really would have been good. What I really want is that steak, but I don't have any room. And many times we come to church with no room. There's no room in here for the steak. Because we've been feeding on so much garbage that we get there and think, you know, I just didn't feel it today. <laughs> and you can give them a taste, and someone's going, oh, my God, I've been waiting for the steak. Oh, it's so good. And you give it a taste to us, and they're like, they're trying to eat it, but they're so full of this other stuff. It's like, I wish I could enjoy this, but I'm, maybe next week. I'll be hungry next time. I'll save my appetite. It's just the reality of, of how life will try to get you. The enemy will try to get you full of things that you don't need. So how, again, do we, do we increase the stuff that God's telling us to pursue? What do we do in the kingdom to get more? Give it away. We give it away. We look for opportunity to give away love, and love will begin to increase. One of the greatest messages I've ever heard, it's, it's really interesting because I didn't remember the name, one of, the, one of my favorite messages I ever preached is called, There is More. It's my favorite message I ever preached. Too. My wife's too. There's a message I heard from another minister called, There's More. They're not even related in their subject, even a little bit. They're not related. Mine's about glory, and there's always more, and it, and it deals start, starting in Exodus with Moses and some of the things that happened through there. That's, that's just, I love that. This one that I heard there is more is from another man named Keith Moore. That's a good name, Moore. And he was on another man's program, and he was teaching on love. And it was one of the greatest messages I've ever heard. I listened to the series because he would come on each day, and I, would, and I got the whole set, and I would listen to it over and over and over again. And then I had an opportunity with some friends, we went to Branson, Missouri. We had gone up in the Ozarks and got Prayer Mountain, and we had prayed and spent time with the Lord. And then we went over to Branson, and we went to go see Keith's church. And so I'm like, we're going to go to his church. And we come in. They had just moved into a brand-new building. That was the first service. It's not even ready yet. And they're in their new building. And I'm sitting there, and I look, and I see a person I know from here. Except he's ushering over there. I'm like, he's at this church now. Oh, my gosh. He's at this church. And so I'm waiting for him to come by. You know, he's doing the offering, and I'm just like, I'm, I'm like, what's up? And he's like, oh, hey. And he, I'll talk to you after service. And so we're waiting, and here he comes, and we're like, what's going on? And we're trying to catch up. And I said, man, it's so crazy seeing you here. And I said, I told him, I said, I heard this message from Keith Moore called There's More. And it was about love, one of the best messages I've ever heard. And he goes, oh, my gosh, that's the message I heard. And I said, I have to move here and be under that man. I'm telling you, the impact was real. You know what the, what the message was all about? Love, just love. And the more I listened to it, 
the more I was conscious of needing to operate in it. Didn't mean I was getting perfected in it. Didn't mean, man, look at me now. I'm walking in love. But it meant I was more conscientious. Did my, was that response love? Am I looking for someone to show love to? I was just feeding myself on something that was a commandment. And it was empowering me at the same time. The power was in the word. Pursue love. If you meditate on pursue love, the power of love will come into you in the commandment. The power of the word of God is within the word of God yes. to bring itself to pass. Yes, it is. It's within the word. Just like when we said, hey, uh, let's get some people to pray for Juan. He's been dealing with this on his knee. And people gathered around. You notice when Kathy started praying, she didn't say, Jesus, would you please come and heal Juan? She prayed the way Jesus prayed, be healed. Jesus didn't say, God, Father, would you come and heal this leper? Did he? He said, be cleansed. Sometimes he said, let it be done to you according to your faith. He'd say, do you believe I'm able to do this? I do believe. Then let, then let it be done to you according to your faith. And he would tell them to be healed, and they'd be healed. When we pray for people, I don't, when someone says, would you pray for my so-and-so or my aunt or my, oh, they're going through this, I do pray for them, but I don't go, oh, God, that's so terrible. Would you please come and help them? Would you please... I pray if they say this person is battling cancer. Let me, uh, uh, these are words to help, okay? Words to help for us to transform our mind, transform the way we speak. Please don't ask me to pray for your arthritis. Don't ask me to pray for your heart condition. Don't ask me to pray for your blood disorder. Don't ask me to pray, don't ask me to pray for your sickness because it's not yours. So quit taking ownership of it. And just say, would you play, pray that this stupid arthritis would leave? <laughs> I can do that. <laughs> but it's not yours. Would you pray for my aunt's heart condition? No, but I'll pray for your aunt. Sometimes you just try to shock people so they can see what they're saying. Would you pray for my aunt's heart condition? Lord, bless that heart condition. <gasps> no, no. <laughs> Tell them what, you know, pray with authority, the way Jesus would pray. I'm just trying to say, we started seeing changes when we started praying the way Jesus prayed. We didn't see when we begged God to do something he'd already done. By his stripes, we were healed. That sickness, that disease is, is trespassing. The enemy will see how far he can push. And you got to tell him to get. You have to stand against him. Hello? Yep. But I don't stand against him just by my own authority. I stand against him according to the word of God. The power is in the word. Here's the word. Pursue peace with all men. That's a pursuit that we have to do. It's up to us to pursue. And not just sanctification and the sanctification. That's Hebrews 12, 14 without which no man will see the Lord. I think pursuing sanctification is important if it says, without which no man will see the Lord. <laughs> Hello? Yeah. But the problem is, if you, if you go there, you will have people sometimes just give up. Like, man, I'm not living sanctified. Good news, pursue sanctification. Good news, the Word of God says, pursue it. I'm pursuing it. I need your sanctification, Jesus. See, I'm not going to be sanctified enough to get to heaven. I don't know about you. I have to pursue the sanctification that was given to me. It's in a person. It's in a person. Because the more, listen, the more you think that you're going to get to one day and arriving and then no more temptations, no more failures, no more stumbling, you're going to be in a continual place of frustration. I, I'm, listen, I, I, I'm far from perfect, far, far, far 
far abundantly beyond far from perfect. But one thing that I, that I do believe that God has graced me with is I'm quick to repent. Not always, I may screw up for a while, like waller in some stuff, but when he opens the eyes and he's like, you can't do this, I'm running back to him. I'm not going to halfway in, halfway out, well, oh, no, I'm kind of sorry. I'm going to repent. And if I mess up the next week, I'm repenting. And I'll try to forgive the same way. If someone does something to me, I want to forgive. I just want to forgive. I want to forgive them as fast as I can forgive them because I don't want anything keeping anything between me and God. Amen? Listen, I, mean, I, 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 can't, I can't preach it like a fantastic preacher, but I'm telling you, if you take some of these practical things and do them, make sure that when you fall, run fast back to him. Don't wait till you feel good enough to go back. Because the enemy will heap on you more and more of unworthiness on you over and over. And sometimes it's hard when you, you know you have people around you because, you know, when we have most of our failures, this is not popular, but this is real life. Most of our failures happen around family. You know, because we will lose our temper with someone that we're closest to. or we'll, what it, They've seen us at our best, and they've seen us at our worst. Right? right yeah. So sometimes it's really hard to just go deep after God when you're around people that saw you really blow it. <laughs> it takes courage to go I'm, I'm just stepping toward Jesus. If you are in a place where you don't know God, where he's not like your personal savior and you haven't really made him Lord, if you're in that place, the enemy will whisper to you continually, you're okay, you're good, you're fine, you're okay. And the heart's kind of burning a little bit to make a step to just like, I need to get my life right with God. And he's like, you're, no, no, you're okay. You're like, look, everybody else just like you. Everybody, look, they all fail. You're fine. You're fine. You're fine. And then you get the courage to respond to that little nudge going, and you like, no, I'm, I'm not fine. <laughs> and then you pray, like, God, forgive me. Cleanse me by your blood. Wash me. I'm sorry. Make me whole. I just want to follow you. Amen. And you sit down, that same voice comes to you. Now, you're, you're, you're filthy, you're dirty, you're nothing. The one that said you're fine a minute ago, now that you've repented, oh, you, but, but you're filthy. You're, you're horrible. He doesn't want anything to do with you. Look at you. You're a hypocrite. He just flips the script as soon as you repent. It's always going to be to keep distance between you and God. The thing that, that he can never attain is closeness and connection with God ever again, ever. And the one thing you have that he envies the most is you are connected to God, and you are always going to be connected to God. And there's no separation unless you decide to walk away. And as you walk away, he's following you. <laughs> the Lord is like, just turn, turn. And when you, I mean, you turn and you bump into his face. He's like, I was right here. I, I did, you didn't distance yourself. You, you walked hard. You ran from me. People say, I've been running from God. You ain't getting anywhere. It's just hilarious to me how we think we can run from God. It's kind of like... He's faster. He's faster. I remember, I, it'll date me a little bit, my, my, I used to watch Deion Sanders play defense. Those guys would run from Deion. He'd be like... Uh -huh. Like he was like, no problem. <laughs> and then as soon as they throw the ball, he's like, let me go ahead and make up that 30 yards and intercept the ball. He's like, he's right there. Just waiting. I, I, he's faster than me. I can't catch him. Throw it to him. And then he'd go and get it. God's just like, just, he's right with you. I've been running from God for a year. Why? It's time to just make a quick turn and pursue him. Pursue love. Pursue sanctification. 
I want to read a couple things to you and we'll close, okay? Romans 14, 17, I keep coming back to this. For the kingdom of God is not eating or drinking, but it's righteousness and it's peace and it's joy in the Holy Spirit. For he who is... The, who, who, he who in this way serves Christ is acceptable to God and approved by men. So then, we pursue the things which make for peace and the building up of one another. Do you know if you read your scriptures about praying for people, do you know who you're going to pray for the most? Other believers. <laughs> Encouraging one another. We're the ones that need it. Right here. It's one another. The enemy's not... Messing with the people he already has. They're walking in death. He's not messing. He's messing with you. He's trying to discourage you don't belong here. You don't fit. You're the one who's the outcast. You're the one who's different. Yeah, you, maybe you are different, but maybe you're just the different we need. We just, we're the body of Christ. And we're all completely different. The hand, the foot, the nose, everything's different on purpose. The body would look weird if it's just a bunch of hands walking around. <laughs> we just need to be ourselves. be you. Like Papa Jack Taylor used to say, be yourself. Everyone else is taken. Just be you. It's always going to be about this. Others first. That's it. It's always about others first. Anything else is out of order as far as the kingdom of God. 1 Timothy 6, 11. He talks about, this is the context. He just talked about the pursuit of money and riches. And then he says this, but flee from these things, you man of God, and pursue righteousness godliness, faith, love, perseverance, and gentleness. These are all things that we've been commanded to pursue, and the power to get them is in the word that commanded us to pursue it. If you don't feel like you're one of those gentle people, the next time you feel that kind of rising up, you just say, devil, it is written to pursue gentleness. It is written. It is written to pursue holiness and sanctification. When you're not feeling so sanctified, you need to tell the devil what the word says. Devil, it is written to pursue the sanctification. Because without that, no man's going to see the, king, see the kingdom of God. But I'm going to see God. I'm going to see God. I'm going to leave you with this last thing. It's from the first verse we started with. 1 Corinthians 14, 1. Pursue love, yet earnestly desire spiritual gifts, but especially that you prophesy. You know what that tells me? It's great to pursue love, but there's still something more. These spiritual gifts and prophecy and things of that nature are important to God. And he's telling us to zealously desire them. And God never says, look, I want you to really, 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 really want this. Nope, can't have it. He doesn't do that to us. He's like, I want you to pursue it, to zealously go after it. And as soon as you do, look, um, you can become immune to this if you learn that it's coming. When I used to teach martial arts, we had something called punishment drills. Punishment drills were you stood in a horse stance, which was very low, and you put your hands behind your back, and your partner hit you. He hit you in the stomach. And he hit you soft, just boom, 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 boom. And then you would say, hit, hit. And every time you said hit, he had to increase power. And after a while... You would get to the point, I know it sounds weird because we were weird, but you would get to the point where they're full on hitting as hard as they can, and you're going, hit, hit, and then something clicks, and you go, hit, 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 and you're just mocking them. 
and they're boom, 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 and you're just mocking them. And it's just, and it's not a demonic thing. It's a conditioning drill that you do, and you finally realize, I know what's coming. I've been doing this for years. I know what's coming. It's a lot better than, he's going to hit me. He's going to hit me. The devil's going to come if you pursue spiritual gifts. If you pursue prophecy, he will come. If you pursue sanctification, he's coming to resist that. So what? It's not for you to, oh, no, then I'm not doing it because then the devil will come. Don't ask God for patience or, or you know what will happen if you ask him for patience. All these trials are come. Yeah, you don't want to be perfected lacking in nothing. I've heard Christians tell me, brother, don't, pay, don't pray for patience. <laughs> That's a weird fear mindset. I and you were created to be more than a conqueror. We are warriors, and you cannot be a warrior without a war. We are not couch potatoes in fear of the enemy swinging at us. We are warriors armed for battle, and our weapons are not carnal, but they're mighty through God. And the warfare armor that we wear is not even our own. It is the armor of God. So put the faceplate down. The enemy doesn't know who's in there. For all he knows, Jesus is in there. And just keep the faceplate down and say what Jesus would say. Do what Jesus would do. And it'll have the exact same effect on the enemy. That sword will poke him the same when you swing it as when Jesus swings it. The power is in the word, and we've been given all authority. All power has been given to me, Jesus said. Now you go. Yes. Go in his name. Go in his name. We've been receiving this, and now it's time to pursue the spiritual gifts for everybody. Listen, one of the, one of the best things that we could have happen is what happened last week. Last week, we did what we would consider kind of a normal service, except Kai got a word. Angela got a word. Pam got a word. All these things started coming. Some were confirmations. Some were interpretations of tongues. Some were just encouragements that had to come. But the entire body has something to release. The entire body has something to release. In order, it can work and be effective. It's not made for you're an audience, and here's the platform where we perform. That's not church. God is going to break the mold. If we quit pursuing what men call success. Because men call the size, the amount of money, the speakers you can get to come, that is a successful church. I call a successful church just what we have even today. Half the members are gone, they're traveling. That's successful. You know why? Because they're emailing and texting and saying, hey, I won't be there. This, I'm going to my sister's house because she grieves at this time of the year. I need to be with her during this season because this is the anniversary of such and such. So I need to, awesome. I need to be there because we're going to the cemetery for this, this, this. And this is going to be the first time families got together. We're going to see some restoration. That's church. Yeah. But the world says, wow, there's empty seats. We're not successful. If more people were sitting listening to my message, we'd be successful. I say if more people are doing his message, we're successful. Amen. Doing. Amen. So that's what we're, God is working us through this thing systematically. Have you noticed? Yeah. It's been about love. It's been about faith. It's been about love. It's been about faith. Love and faith and how it all works together. Receiving the love of the Father, giving the love of the Father away. Believing him for the miraculous, even when it's huge and seems impossible, he's right there in it. And it's about everybody else being first. We just put other people first. And then we got everything turned right side up in the kingdom. And let's get some multiplication. How? Let's give it away. Give it away. It'll come. Let's sow. Everything's a seed, guys. Amen? Y'all stand up with me. Whoo! Hey, guys, next Sunday. Don't miss next Sunday. Derek Evers is going to be here next Sunday. Um, for those of you who don't normally do this, bring something to take notes. 
and try your best because <laughs> there's going to be a lot of revelation coming, and then you're going to probably want to watch it again on social media or on YouTube because I'm tell- he's going to bring a team with him too. We got some other guys coming along with Derek. Uh, we're just blessed. It's going to be a good, a good time. So next Sunday, if you're in the area, please come on out and uh, partake. So what do you think? Let's, uh, let's agree together. How about that? Father, we just come to you in agreement that your word is final authority. And we take you at your word, and we ask you right now, God, to move in your power. We are pursuing you. We are pursuing love. We are pursuing sanctification, even if we trip, stumbled, fall, no matter what distance we think we've fallen. We ask you, Lord, to turn us back to you. We turn to the kingdom. We turn to the, the, the throne. We turn to the ark of the covenant. We turn to the grace that you give us, Lord. We come boldly to that throne right now to receive it from you, to walk in it. And before we leave, Lord, we just stand with our brothers and sisters. If there's anybody in this room right now, I'm not going to embarrass you. We just want to do some business with God, and I'm not going to let anybody know at all. This is you and God. But I can see in the spirit, I know that I know that there are people that are dealing with some stuff and they don't feel worthy. There is shame and there needs to be removal of that shame right now. It's time to get right with God. And he's eager. So if that's you, we're all going to say this prayer together with you, okay? But just say this together with us, okay? Say, oh God. Here I am. am. You know me. You know know everything about me. me. Nothing is hidden from your sight. sight. And you know the things things that make me feel shame shame. and that have kept me distant. distant. I'm asking you, Father, Father, to wash me, to to cleanse me. me. You You offered your blood. So I could be clean. So I receive what you did for me. And I turn away from my sin. And I turn to you. Fill me, Lord, with your Holy Spirit. So I can live holy. I want to be like you. Thank you, Lord. For accepting me into your family, into the kingdom. And I'm never going to be alone. I'm never alone. You're always with me. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.